loves. It's your girl, Keeks. And today we are talking about the powerful, seductive, and wildly entertaining entertainment vehicle that is the rom-com. Yes. What? I mean, just who doesn't love the genre? I mean, am I right? Each generation since the invention of film and TV comes of age with an idea of love as told by rom-coms. It's a rite of passage, you know? But why do we seem to love defining romance through make-believe? Why? Uh, to answer that, I'm talking to the incredibly talented and hilarious Annie Momolo. She is the writer of Bridesmaids, and we're going to talk all about rom-coms. But first, you know, we're going down the rabbit hole with Mama Sharon and my friend Max. What's up, hey. y'all? Hey. Let's just start right out with it. Do you, you know, do you love rom-coms? Are you a rom-com person? And tell me your favorite rom-com, if you can decide, because you know there's really uh -oh. a few. <laughs> well... I mean, wow. who doesn't love a little rom-com action? And I have to show my true colors. I do love a little Julia Roberts, Notting Hill, finding love with Hugh Grant and his bumbling English buffoonery. That's always a delight. So, yes, I... <laughs> the romance. But uh, that late 90s string of Julia Roberts, where the runaway bride where she's running and Notting Hill, they're all so good, but I, I have a soft spot for those two in particular. Sharon? There's this little movie and as that had Julia Roberts, not Julia Roberts, but Sandra Bullock, oh. called "While You Were Sleeping." <gasps> I really like that you little like that movie. Oh, Sharon, that's sweet. Yeah, I thought it was so really romantic, really Mom. Yeah. She loves a lot. Like yeah. when she likes a rom a, a, a romance, she goes there. She's talking about ghosts and stuff. <laughs> like she really yeah. loves the dramatic romances. Okay, so I love rom-coms. I'm a rom-com girl. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm always into it. It can even be a bad one. It's no big deal for me. But I do think that there was an era in the time where rom-coms were a little bit more grounded, a little bit more realistic. I think now times people put it together and they're just like, let's let's just do all the tropes. And it's like, are we a satire? Are we being a spoof? Or is this really a rom-com? Like, where, where did this movie go real quick? Um, so I think that yeah. some of my favorites would be like, you know, The Wood, if that's considered one. Um, what else is a rom-com that I love? I love any of the Meg Ryan ones. Any of, you know, You mm. Got Mail, any of that little stuff. Um, yeah. What else do I like, rom-coms that I like? I mean, there's just so many. I, I'm trying to think about what my favorite one is. Because um, Love and Basketball really isn't a rom-com. Uh, oh, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Love that one. That was a real fun. Oh, 10 yeah. Things I Hate About You. Julia Stiles never gets enough love for me. I mean, she does, but it's just like, I want more for her. You know what I mean? Because yeah. Julia is just everything. And I love taking the old school thing and making it new. Like, come on, you better make Shakespeare young and modern for the kids. I love that. Now, what was that movie with Gabrielle Union and LL Cool J and the sisters? That was a good movie. That was a rom-com, oh, wasn't it? Oh, oh, Deliver? Yes, yeah, sure was. Deliver Us From Evil. Deliver that was good too. Yeah, that was good. That Deliver was good. Us from Eva was very good. You better bring up that old school. <laughs> now let's not forget about if you're gonna bring up Deliver Us from Eva, then you gotta bring up two could play that game. Oh yes, you do. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I love that. I love yes. to play the game. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so I mean, what do you guys think? Because like I, I kind of was saying it a little bit, but, you know, some of my favorite rom-coms are from the early 2000s, and I felt like that was the golden age of mm. rom-coms. But nowadays, you know, when people try to do a lot of the romantic comedies, they just come out seem so cheesy. And I'm here for it, but it's just different from what they used to be. And so I don't know, why do you guys think that it's changed, you know? Or do you prefer the overly cheesy as opposed to the classic? <sighs> Well, you know, for me, because I think it doesn't work as well because, you know, now how we communicate is so different than how we used to communicate. So back in the day when you waited by the phone with bated breast and you met someone in a coffee shop and it was all romance and weather. And now, you know, so often we meet digitally or on apps. And I just think because in rom and, you know, rom-coms will try to do that, but it's just, it seems so inauthentic, even though that's how we live, that it's just not as entertaining to me. It's not as it's not as vibrant if you will of a romance you know it kind of it just i'm like oh this is like too yeah. it's too real life uh i want my i want my fantasy i don't i, I just I, I agree with that too but i also just you know i i'm just into romance and love and to me if the the actors have to have chemistry like to me a lot of the casting is not 
you know, is not up to par. Sometimes you see this and you're like, you said, I can't even look. away. You, you know, you it's like I can't even believe you are mm. with her. And I'm sitting there watching the whole movie, like, they not even compatible. There's no chemistry here. So y'all expect me to buy into this whole damn story and the casting director let y'all asses <laughs> down before the movie even started. I, I'm I can't even believe that he yeah. would look at her or vice versa. So I think yeah, that's it's, a big it is problem. true. I think a lot of times it seems as if they're just looking to see whoever name that they can just jump into the movie. You know, they're not really caring about actually trying to get the chemistry. They're like, they're like, she's got a million followers. He's got 5 million followers together. It's a hit. And it's like, they don't even really translate. So no, it's not a hit. And we know what you're doing and we want to just see something be good, you know, but I do think that there's something that people have fallen to with rom-coms where they just care about making they just they they don't care about reinventing the conversation mm. around a rom com. They feel like you already know what's gonna happen, and so they just give you that exactly um, instead of actually finding a new story. And I think you're right, Max. I think a part of that that makes us annoyed is the fact that things ain't the same. You know, it's not the same. Mm. Like you you know, life isn't the same. So so you you do kind of have to be forced to reinvent the wheel. Otherwise, we're just gonna see through everything and know that you're not really trying to give us anything new. You're just trying to like get a home run on the same thing. You know, it's almost like what they did with horror movies where they just made it too ridiculous. And it's like, come on, get get original with it. Take the genre somewhere else. Yeah, take it somewhere new and fresh. But then on the same yeah, token, definitely. don't you think we also get so hooked on the, we want something new and fresh, but then we're also like, oh, don't have them split up. Give them a happy ending. You know, I think we want it both ways where we want it to be. <laughs> we want it to be new and fresh, but then also. Well, that brings me to yeah. my next question when it comes to rom-coms. Do you think TV and entertainment is meant to give you something real or meant to give you something fake? And what is your actual view on what love is? And let me break down what what, what I'm really trying to say with this. Because, for instance, love and basketball, as the years have gone by, people have really tore that movie apart. Uh, mainly because they feel like, oh, the guy didn't really show her much love. You know, he wasn't really a good man. And da 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 And they, you know, kind of tear it apart, Right. But at the same time, my thing is a lot of relationships are imperfect. So what do you really expect and what do you really want to see? Do you want to see everything go well? And are you just looking for a movie to paint you a perfect kind of idea of what love is? Or are you really looking for for something to be a little bit more realistic and actually show you that love is not difficult? Because I do think, you know, I do think sometimes with rom-coms, it does leave people to expect unbelievable shit where it's like that's just not how what love is you know what i mean love's not love's not so perfect like that all the time does that totally. make sense yeah it makes sense um i mean me i'm just an incurable romantic you know but i like sex up here so <laughs> i'm looking for something with couples that are compatible and you know there's some romance going on and some love and some you know stuff like that <laughs> i like romance you know i'm borderline porn so you know i i want to see uh i, I, I want to see some compatibility and some love and some you know <laughs> that's what i want to see yo, i really do where did sharon go where did sharon go i asked <laughs> if she wanted love if hey. she wanted flawless love or if she wanted I, realistic love she said i want porn <laughs> i want love <laughs> hey i watched i watched carol the two women they had a sex scene it was all it was good <laughs> mom i'm out of, when i tell you i'm out of here and on the damn floor <laughs> so if you could be in a rom-com and I mean, this is a hard question, but if you could be in any rom-com, which one could you see yourself actually oh. in? I guess best man. Best man. Now, Sharon, best man, best who man. you going to be in that? Um, well, I'd have to, they'd have to make up a character. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see any of them women that I could be. But, sure. I mean, I could make a guest <laughs> appearance. I would do Bridget Jones's diary because in that she's supposed to be so unattractive, but she keeps every hot British man is in love with her. And that sounds delightful. So I would say Bridget Jones's diary for mm. me and me as Bridget. I would play Bridget. He said that, that. I could totally, I could totally see that. I could totally see that. And by the way, I thought I immediately knew, I thought I immediately knew which rom-com that I was going to be in. And I was going to say, say the last uh, dance because I love dancing. 
I'm here for a dance yeah. scene. You know what I mean? I don't I don't know about the interracial part. It doesn't need to have that <laughs> per se, but I'm definitely here for it if that was what it would be. But I'm really here for the dancing. I'm really here for the saving of the last dancing. So that one I could totally see myself in. And then I thought about my girl Drew Barrymore. Never been kissed. Yeah. I love a let me go back to high school and rewrite history mm. gag. That yeah. was so good. And then that made me think about 51st dates. Come on. Yes. 51st Dates yeah. is a really a good one. Can you imagine somebody that just want to keep making you fall in love with That's them every day? Charming. I love Adam Sandler, Drew Barrymore. It was giving me everything I needed and more. Everything I needed and more. Yeah, those are some great ones for, for sure. So There's so many of them, but like I say, give me the sexy ones. So we're just finishing up this, this, this last question that I asked y'all, which was, what is your favorite rom-com trope? And Mine was from friends to lovers. And the reason why is because I got to be honest, I do love a little like, you know, I thought that I loved her, but I just couldn't say I do. It was always you. I love that. I love that kind of moment where he just turned around and said, I object. You know, I love that. I just think that's so cute when it's like, you know what? I really changed your life and really changed your world. Like, I just love that kind of vibe. So I love a friends to lovers type gag. Love that. I think mine is, uh, I love a montage, but in romantic comedies, you know, there's that, there's usually like, it's a date scene and they're on a boat and then they're eating an ice cream. You know, I love a montage set to some kind of upbeat song. And I think romance movies, oh, they do that so yeah. Well. But doesn't the montage always let you know, whenever you see a romantic, like a rom-com go into a montage, you know, their asses are going to be broken up in the next scene. You know, when the shit gets too happy and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Five seconds later, it's about to be like, my ex yeah, it's, they've all, it's always <laughs> it always they they cute. have sex and then there's a montage and then they break up. I gotta ask you guys this too: What is your least favorite trope <laughs> of the rom coms? What is the one that you think they need to bury and just let it go away? Oh, <laughs> Sharon, your face. Uh. I for, for me, it's the it's it's the <laughs> salty, sassy, whatever adjective you want to do friend that's there to kind of offer advice it's like just cut that friend out they they don't give those yeah. people anything to do oh you're it's so like, right oh, just let that go yeah. so move right. the story along yeah the stereotypical friend and I, I you know what i have to echo that sentiment and say that but also the parents there's always some in every other one there's the parent that thinks he's not good enough or she's not good enough i'm not good enough for your parents and all this stuff <laughs> parents shut the hell up shit let your child marry who the hell they want to shit i'm just happy y'all find the people to marry y'all find the people to marry where's the wedding <laughs> You guys, I am so excited to get into it with my next guest because if there's anyone who knows a thing or two about writing rom-coms, it's this girl. Because let me tell you, her movie Bridesmaid may be one of the best rom-coms of all time. Please welcome to the show, the talented Annie Mumolo. Annie, thank you so much for coming to the show. I'm really geeked out because like I said, Bridesmaids was one of my favorite, I mean, it is one of my favorite rom-coms and I feel like it totally shook up, you know, the rom-com space in such a, a, a authentic and original way and I want to get to that but first I, I kind of want to start at the top of it with your love for rom-coms and kind of what brought you to the point of creating bridesmaids because I feel like rom-coms had a certain formula you know you think about the late 90s the early 2000s the Meg Ryan Nora Ephron world which obviously we love those um they're classics and everything kind of followed suit with that but then bridesmaids happened and then people were trying to be daring again and and then now i feel like we're in this place where it's kind of gotten like it's almost like a, a rom-coms are being a satire of themselves and, and so i'm yes. curious of of what you think about the journey of, of rom-coms and why that is oh gosh well that that's a huge question <laughs> but you know huge question right it actually I know. it's a great question i think it actually um it kind of probably is something that has to do with all movies and comedies in particular um, I think comedies used to be in a certain budget range and those budget range movies don't really get made right now as much. It's almost never. Um, we're in like big tentpole 
times and so mm. like superheroes and all that so wait when you say budgets what do you mean like what's what's a, what's a typical budget you think for like when we think about those amazing rom-coms what I would be the budget those are like 30 to 30 to 50 million dollar movies no yeah and why because i mean when you think about it it's like i mean i guess they have big set pieces but i mean in my mind i'm thinking it's just brilliant writing great actors like what i mean but maybe they cost is that the gag well to be let me like to be fair like the, the probably the bigger ones on the higher end like the 50 ones are when you have like hugely you know bigger celebrities and all of that um i believe bridesmaids was in an under like between 25 to 30 i want to say but that's with you know people not those aren't huge paychecks do you know what i mean um yeah so it's kind of um they were like in the, i'd say most typically in like the 30 to 40 but I, I you could see them go from like 50 and a little higher i think and that just doesn't happen anymore wow so they just don't bring in the money as much anymore therefore people don't invest in them and, and that, but that's interesting to me right because obviously bridesmaids was a hit you know we think about even you know i feel pretty that was a hit mm -hmm. like we've had some really good rom-coms that you know sprinkles of ones that have come forth in this new generation that have you know been in incredibly huge hit so i'm wondering wh why is the taste not there or is it just they're just not original anymore are, are we too wrapped up in the action marvel space when it comes to big theatrical releases i mean i would love to see more god i'd love to see more of those mid-level budget move just comedies in general and romantic yeah. comedies um you know uh, I feel like I grew up loving all of those kinds of movies and they just aren't as much around anymore. And yeah, um, it's true. But I think in the it's business wise in general, the business gets into trends and then something trends and then everybody jumps on top of that trend and then just like runs the trend out. <laughs> um, uh, it's so ridiculous. It's so weird. And, and, and it, um, it's also less chance there's not a lot of chance taking it i think historically mm -hmm. in showbiz there's just not a lot of um chance taking risk taking um when it comes to, people want to take the same model some they there's a model that works and then they just yeah. go and like replicate it and replicate it and replicate it until you know it's it's like dead and then you have actually have me thinking also about the fact that if we go back in time i do wonder like if those movies hit, I mean, I'm sure many of them did actually hit big in the box office, but I'm wondering if, you know, that was also the era of DVDs, you know, uh -huh. and videotapes, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm wondering if like those films were more so of, of a success in that regard. And that's why people still were willing to spend the big bucks on them when it came to studios, as opposed to now it's like, no one's buying movies anymore. Like, so, so if yeah. it doesn't hit big in the theater, no one's going to go home and cut up on the couch because they're just going to watch it on streaming and that can or cannot make money i don't even know how they make money with streaming but i have an idea that yeah. they probably made more with dvds you know and, and all that yeah i mean there's so many factors that are influencing what's currently going on there's been such a huge uh sort of turnover since um covid and like moves yeah. to streaming and um i will say that i do think what has made what i used to be drawn to when i was watching like like romantic comedies or you know um it, it was a, a like someone's original unique voice gets through um yes you know the formula thing is like it's like it's fun for a while and and it has that fantasy element but yes. one of the reasons, yeah one of the reasons we made bridesmaids was because i saw um bridget jones diary and i was like oh, oh my god they finally a movie where they have like a normal original girl voice whose yeah. problems and life seem to match her and and it's not like you know um nothing against beautiful supermodels believe me but like a supermodel who's like i just can't get a man and i live in a i work in a i'm an assistant at this my job but i live in a four million dollar apartment and I'm, you know i'm a maid in manhattan yeah <laughs> um literally no i totally get it i totally get you yeah it's 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 about um unique voices i think um um authentic voices getting all the way through to the end it's hard to get a movie made where that happens where do you think that that comes from i mean maybe it's twofold but i'm curious was it 
you know, I know you work with Kristen a lot. Mm -hmm. You guys have had a relationship. So mm -hmm. do you think it's from, is, is that your unique voice? Is that her unique voice? Is that you guys together? Like, how do you tap into a un unique voice for creating something as special as Bridesmaids? Well, uh, we do share a similar, very similar voice. I and mean, we come from kind of the same, I think we operate from the same, uh, I don't know what Place. it is, in instinctive sort of mm -hmm. thing that we were instinctively in sync, but um, it is a very instinctive thing. And it kind of like has to be something that strikes you in your core that feels like something you need to say or do. And it has to be a sort of, strong powerful feeling inside that mm. is like oh, you don't have to do this we've always taken chances yeah together um and but it's because we have really believed in what we were doing what was the process like was it did it start with like a top line idea like the name bridesmaids or was it kind of like you know you and irishman or you know how did you guys start to you know outline and create this film and like how long did it take to actually get it all out on oh paper oh my gosh kiki it was a long time <laughs> oh my gosh that's i think that's so cool and i think that that's important to say here because a lot of people think that stuff is going to happen overnight oh, so i think no. it's important to know that really great things do take time it was uh i'd say five years in the making before we got to greenlit um wow we didn't have a title till the very end right before we we had different sort of titles, working titles. And then uh, for some reason, a lot of wedding sort of themed movies had were coming out while we were in the development process because it was five years. And so mm -hmm. it was like, oh, we can't use that now or we can't use that now. And oh, that was going to be like in the area, but we can't use that. And um, towards the very end, Judd Apatow, our producer, who oh, um, he, he just said, you know what? I, I like to call it what it is with movies. And this is a movie about bridesmaids. And so we should just call it bridesmaids. And we're like, oh, and you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> it was a five year development process and it was, um, it was intense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious to know if during the development process, were there any actual scenarios that you or Kristen actually went through that motivated some of the things that happened in the film because it's so relatable Ooh. i think that's why we all loved it. it's like we all done dated a shitty guy we all done had our life falling apart we've uh -huh. all like been through that so i'm wondering if any if you guys pulled from any real life scenarios Bas well uh gosh the movie uh was based on two years two to three years out of my life where i was <gasps> um a bridesmaid i have a huge family and uh, uh all of my family and friends basically in a period of like two and a half years um everybody got married <laughs> and um you know i was living this like totally different life like i was like doing comedy shows and i just wasn't even in that zone but i was a bridesmaid in more than 20 weddings and wow every, yes and every bridal party seems to like have the similar similar characters so i had so many stories and it was just happening and unfolding as we went. And so obviously um, Kristen and I had been working together and we were partners on a lot of things. And so um, we were talking about it and she was like, I think we should do it about that. And she, she, then she brought her own stuff in. And so it started from there, but it was, it was definitely came mm -hmm. from real life. And some of the people are real based on real people. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that. And I'm also curious if what, who was, Melissa McCartney. I'm wondering. <laughs> I love that character. I mean, obviously, oh. we all love that character. So I'm like, where is yeah. she at? <laughs> Melissa McCarthy's character. So Megan was based, actually based on a character that I used to do at the Groundlings that I based on a a person that I went to go look at a house rental. And she had all these machine parts in her backyard. <laughs> And she it. was like, if, just so you know, if you live here, you know, I'm going to be living, I'm going to live, I live here too. <laughs> She's living in the, what the, in an RV, like a camper in her backyard. <clears throat> and um, I was like, oh, and she goes, yeah. And so I just, you just have to like leave room for all my parts. There's all these machine parts. And I was like, not all my parts, oh. yeah. Yeah. She goes, she said, <laughs> she said, I'm building a machine. <laughs> what kind of machine is lady? I don't know. I, I, I didn't stay to find out. I was like, thank you. Uh, I should probably. Um, I love that she ends up being this character that you create and then ends up making it into this huge iconic film. Like, I love that for her. Like, kudos to her for being such an impactful character. 
Oh, she, yeah. She was, and you know, um, obviously Melissa came and brought, you know, the thunder and uh, yeah, it was a, you know, took it to the next, way up to the next level. And so it was, um, yeah, that was a, that was an incredibly uh, miraculous casting. Yeah. I mean, the film was incredibly casted, but it also had, you know, like you were talking about before, rom-coms, they have this kind of fantasy element where there is something that we love about the predicticality of it, where it's, we know they're, they're going to end up together, you know, or, you know, just these little notes that, oh, this is when everything goes wrong. Oh, no, he's going to see when she said that or she's going to see when he does this, you know, and we like that sometimes, but we don't like it to the point where we don't have to watch the movie to actually find out. So I'm curious as to how you balance like giving people what they expect from a rom-com, but then also giving them something new and fresh. Like, you know what I mean? Like, how did you, how did you guys decide which tropes to actually lean into and which ones to kind of run away from? That was a balance that we fought the whole time. <clears throat> um, Judd, our producer um, was very much like, you know, we had, we had ideas and sometimes he was like, put things more into the traditional package and then sometimes it reversed. And sometimes we had something that yeah. was more of a traditional package and he was like, no, 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 we got to blow this one out. We got to blow this one out. This one's got to go like yeah. all out. And um, it is a tough balance, but I think if you remain, again, it's more about staying true to your own voice and your own mm. experiences. And, um, and we were I always very that. much like wanting to do, make sure that we stayed true to like, what would a woman actually do in this situation versus just shooting for broad comedy? Yeah. What would someone really say or what would someone really feel? And then we did have a version where she doesn't end up with him in the end. Right. And, um, I was going to ask, I was like, what yeah. were some of the scenarios that you guys were like, okay, let's change this. Like what, what was one that, you know, ultimately in the movie, it went a different direction than what you guys had first wanted. Oh, the airplane scene was a last minute plug in. What was there before? Just nothing. We had a um, we had a sixty page sequence where they went to Las Vegas. <laughs> so of course, when we started writing, you know, there weren't like what happened. Uh, what's it called? Um, oh my gosh, The Hangover had not come out yet. We didn't even know about The Hangover. Oh my gosh, that, yeah, you guys were really writing it for a minute then. Yeah, we were like way, and then there was like um, what happens in Vegas. There were some like a lot of Vegas themes themed movies that came out with along with a handful of wedding movies, and so. We had a, like a 60 page sequence where she goes to Vegas, but she can't afford to do all the stuff that Helen has like lined up for them to do. So um, she ends up on her own night by herself <laughs> in Vegas. And she gets like in a fight with a, this um, girl who goes to the community college and her friends and um, she gets like beat up and she gets like a horrible night. And um not beat up. <laughs> yeah, she gets like in a fist fight, you know, it's just like, just, and, and um, we have this whole thing where she hooks up with this guy and it's, it was a whole thing. Like he turns out to be much younger than she thought. And then his girlfriend shows up and it's like, oh, oh my girls. gosh, that's actually yeah. very funny though. We loved it. And um, yeah, the hotel she stayed at was like, she had a totally different trip from the other girls. Um, and it was because she couldn't afford what Helen had planned, which did happen to me in real life right. with one of my friends. So anyhow, we had that and um, all these movies then came out and then Judd said, we can't, um, we can't do another thing in Vegas. This was a, oh like probably, I want to say three weeks before we, it was so close to when we started shooting and I was seven months, six months pregnant. And I, oh my he told me this, he's like, you guys have got to toss it. We got to come up with something else. It was Friday. Judd. Was, yeah. Judd. Really, Judd? I cried. But ultimately. <laughs> but ultimately. But ultimately, we blasted something out over the weekend, like from like Friday to Monday, and came back with the airplane scene. And um, that's- And that's like everybody, that's like one of people's favorite scenes. It is, I think it's my favorite scene in the movie now, um, for sure, hands down. That's insane. Talk about like- oh my gosh, clutch, you know, trying to like figure it out. I mean, that's the whole other thing with like movie making and figuring out how to do something that we could go on a tangent on of just like, how do you have to just keep pushing forward to get your thing made, man? I mean, it's so difficult. Oh we talk about how unique Bridesmaids is. Shit, maybe it's just, you know, the reason why they don't get made is because you got to go through all of this stuff. Oh my <laughs> you know God. What I mean? I like tell, it's such a journey. Yeah, it is. I tell people like, take it takes years off my life whenever I do one of these because it's always a case of how bad do you want it? And it almost 
always rips you down just to like, you're like a shred of yourself. And then you start making the movie when you're already like a shred of yourself because of the development process. Then you kind of build yourself back up again. And then you go through the marketing and like, put like all that and then you're a shred again and then you're just it's, it's crazy. no seriously the funnest part is 10 years later when the movie's over <laughs> okay no um yeah so no, i'm curious <laughs> you're right <laughs> i'm you're curious right. because obviously you mentioned groundlings obviously we know Kristen wig from and you know snl i mean you had so many great comedians in bridesmaids what was all like what were some of the scenes that that most was improv like i'm just curious about the improv scenes that you guys did and what made it in the film and like what iconic lines were maybe not written and maybe you guys found in the moment or if you did any in it in it any at all we had a shooting script which you always have which right. we loved you know we were ready to shoot that um, right. but we also had binders with like every version of the script we'd ever written and so when we would you shoot a scene you that morning before the day, we would like have the shooting script. Then we'd have all these other versions and we would go and highlight things. If you wanted to try to grab something from a version that we liked, we would try, but then, so we would get the shooting script. Mm. Um, and then from the shooting script, we would start to improvise and God bless Paul Feig. I mean, I don't know how Paul Feig did this, but I would like sit behind him and we would have, um, usually someone with me helping me and like a joke, other joke writers. And he would, we would start the shooting script and then we would write on post-its like ideas and put it on his, put the post-its on the back of his suit and he would take them and read them and start feeding I mean, people lines. And then from that came improv. And then it, then off their improv, we would write more and put more post-its. Like he was just covered in post-its. <laughs> That's extremely high level stuff. And it's absolutely amazing. Like, I think I would literally have a blast doing something like this. But I mean, if I was the continuity, like if I was scripty or if I was the editor, well, yeah. I'd be fucking shitting bricks. However, yeah. I think that that's absolutely so creative and so much fun. And I mean, that just sounds like you're just playing around. You know what I mean? Like really yeah. just kind of going for balls to the walls. Uh, we were. Um we were, and it was, but it, it's why it sort of was like more of a birthing process. Like right. it was so much output every day. I, and I was pregnant or, and I was like, I went home and like, every day. It was just like 17 hours and like just constantly. And then would just go home and just, I mean, they'd roll me out in the car and I just like go. <laughs> it's so I'm much output. You out. I'm hollering. <laughs> <laughs> That's was, hilarious. I mean, so obviously we're talking about bridesmaids. We're talking about romantic comedies. Um, you've written one of the most iconic, but is that genre one of your favorites? And if not, what is? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> oh, I keep, I love movies. I love all genres. Honestly, I used to watch certain. I used to watch westerns with my dad growing up. Um, I'm a big westerns. western. Uh, my dad loves westerns. Like which ones? My dad watches um so Bonanza. Um, he watched um oh my gosh, what is the other one? There's like you know there's the good there's like the old classics like Magnificent Seven, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. But then like I we watched you know I used to like Silverado was one of my favorites. That's a yeah. that was more one in the eighties. Um, we just those. But I so but I also did love romantic comedies like crazy when I was a teenager. But I loved I used to. The John Hughes, all the all those John Girl, Hughes movies, um, everything John Hughes does. <sighs> yeah, I mean, you just can't. He's I mean, just too good. He knew how to yeah. make the youth real in a way that now I think yes. people write kids like assholes. And not to say that kids can't be assholes, but they just write kids as if they forgot that they were once one. If that yes. makes sense. I don't understand. It's kind of a strange time. Even my daughter is sixteen, and she's like. You know, they just make these movies about like people, they they try to throw like social media stuff in it and to make yes. it seem and it's all, she's like, it's all so cringy, you know, she says, but. um, I talked to Amy Heckerling and we were talking like specifically about this as it pertained to, you know, films that involve youth, high school movies, et cetera, college movies, whatever you have it. And she was just talking about how she really spent time with the kids and that she did write the work from a very inspired space, um, meaning she was trying to tap into what they were going through, but also when, 
kids their age went and watched the movie that they would feel hopeful about where they could go. And I just felt that was so intentional. I don't know if everybody is writing stuff with that same intention. I think a lot of times people are writing stuff, even if it's romantic comedies like we're talking about, they're writing from it from a place of nostalgia. They're not writing from a, from a place of like mm-hmm. currency of like what's happening now or what their experiences are like. The whole time you've been talking about bridesmaids and your process, it's been about your personal experiences. It's been about like, you know, we haven't even gotten into the what, what you wanted people to take from it, but obviously we're going to get there. But ultimately, I think that that has a lot to do with it. Like a lot of things are just in a spin wheel of like, just get a such mm-hmm. and such movie out. We need a high school film. We need a da 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 film. And it's like, yeah, it's not coming from a real place of like, well, why do you want to write? You know, when, when, you know, John Hughes did Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, it was about a kid owning being a kid. Like, even if he was a jerk off kid, like, he deserved to be a jerk off kid because he was a damn kid, you know, like the youth being able to be young and how that is lost when you're an adult and that it's okay to kind of act a fool because you only get to be a kid once. Like that was a deep ass message, you know? So I don't know if everybody, yeah. I liked pretty, pretty in pink a lot and breakfast club. I mean, you know, breakfast club obviously is a classic, but I really liked pretty in pink a lot. I felt like it was so, and I love to, yeah. Um, it just seemed like it had a grittiness to it that was real, yes. you know? And again, that's someone's yeah. voice getting through, you know, though? Because, again, I do think, like, what you were saying is that they just go, oh, we need this kind of movie, so let's... A lot is, like, factory produced now, or it's sort of, like, there's a lot of algorithms that they use. Girl, and It's becoming, literally. like, more robotic, and it's... It's like, who's like, writing these scripts? AIs? I mean... They got the AIs writing the scripts, girl. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so it's, it's terrifying and uh, scary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It is. It is. It is scary. I mean, so speaking to all of this, what would you say was what you wanted people to take from Bridesmaids? I mean, I'm sure you and Kristen both had your own feelings put into what you wanted people to take, but what kind of, you know, what was it like, you know, you're talking about you were bridesmaid all those years and the experiences that you had. What did you learn from it? Like, what did you want to share I think I really wanted to share was that um we all have imperfections and nobody's perfect and we did sort of want to blow the old sort of like the trope of the romantic comedy like perfect person you know we do have flaws and we wanted a more realistic approach to telling these stories and we actually didn't see it as a romantic comedy when we made it we saw it as sort of an ensemble female comedy but we did end up adding um the love interest chris's character and which is just amazing the best thing one of the best things we did in that movie but i do um, think it it also is equally as strong in a conversation about being a female driven just like comedy because it it is that as well it is it's like rom-com but it also is totally like a female ensemble comedy yeah that was more of our set our set we, what we set out to do you guys also kind of burst open the whole thing that I love too especially as like a, a very driven independent kind of woman is like this whole concept I mean and just as a woman we can even take the everything else I said just like just being a woman like this whole like Prince Charming thing um you know with mm-hmm. the whole John Ham of it all where, where it's like you think that that's the guy you got to be with or that you know this is this is how I show my value and the kind of guy you know how much money he makes or or how how you know cool he is or you know how pop whatever it is that you know we're thinking that makes somebody a Prince Charming and then you you coupled it with someone that was just a real person that actually was a value because of how they treated people. And obviously that feels cliche, but the way that it was shown in the film was really like, get a good look because this is really what love is about. Love is not about what people have and the things that they can give you that are tangible. It's about the things that people can give you that are in, like, that are like priceless, you know, which is kindness, yeah. you know, respect value, like truly like, a being a value person, you know, and it's not something that's monetary. And I think that that's so good and important. You know, I, I think that's like a super important in this day and age that we're in where shit, sometimes the only thing that goes across people's mind is, can you help me out? <laughs> you know, because yes, are so and tough. also like image. Yes. Image, image. Is, like image is so much now with like social media and everything. It's how things look and what, man, what are your stats? It's, it's, 
Pearl is terrible. Oh, it's so disturbing. It is. Baby, this is Kiki Palmer, yeah. So what's your favorite rom-com trope and favorite rom-com? And if you have a couple, I won't, you know, hold you to it. Well, I don't know if this is a trope, <laughs> but a lot of people started to copy this, but I loved the ending scene of when in When Harry Met Sally when he tells her all of her little like quirks. I think that is totally that is totally a trope and they do it more so now in the indie rom-coms where it's like yes. maybe it's the way you hate the rain. Yes. Or the way that you <laughs> Yes. Someone my daughter just or showed the way me you... someone... Yes. Oh, the meme? Was... Your daughter showed you the meme, right? She the showed indie me girl some, meme? a girl. There's a girl on social media who does who does like independent romantic comedy girl or whatever. She's so funny and she does oh. <laughs> Have you seen her? It's so funny. It's so funny. It's like, maybe it's the way that you always flip your hair before you brush yes. your teeth. Like, what's yeah. the fuck? Like, so yes. funny. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's totally a trope for sure. But I loved When Harry Met Sally. I loved Moonstruck. Um, oh, Moonstruck. I loved That's more in like, as I got into my 20s, I, Bull Durham was probably my favorite one that Kevin Costner and Susan Sarandon. Um, and then I would have to say Girls Trip. I don't know if you call that a romantic comedy, but that one, like, just, like, that movie just killed me. That movie killed me. Oh, my me. gosh. You have very eclectic taste. All these are, you know, we went to a very, like, super cinematic, like, I love cinema. And then we went to, like, oh, commercial. Like, you know, I loved it. I don't know. I like, do like everything, and I do watch everything. So it's, it just depends on, you know, where I'm at, I guess, in my life. I um, love that. I'm the same freaking way. Like, I like a little bit of everything because I don't know. I, I guess that's, you know, it, it's what keeps you inspired. You know, you if you really love film, you're going to love to check out all kinds of it. Yeah. So that makes me wonder what's next for you. I mean, what what space are you in currently as a creative, you know, in, in, in writing and just the work that you want to do and put out there? Gosh, you know, um, I have a few movies coming out this year that I acted in. Um, one is called The Idea of You, and it's... Um, directed by Michael Showalter and starring Anne Hathaway. And um, like, I play her best friend in that. I'm excited about that one. Um, writing wise, I'm kind of different. I do all all over the place I'm, right now. I'm, I have an idea that I'm developing, uh, but it's going to take, you know, it takes, you know, it takes 10 years. <laughs> time. Well, you know, so, in the time that it's taking, just kind of keep in the back of your mind, like Kiki Palmer, Kiki Palmer. You know, like kind of just let that name just sink in for you. Kiki Palmer, Kiki Palmer, you know, while you're Oh, I have that name. I have that name in the back. Let's keep it somewhere in the back. I have that name in there. It's in there. <laughs> Kiki, I saw Nope, and I am still scared. And I saw it so long ago. Oh, I'm so I'm well, glad you scared. checked it out. I'm so glad. <laughs> you know what? You know I was saying? I like Westerns and... um. When it first opened, I was like, notes. oh, this movie looks like a West. It's kind of like, oh, and yeah. then and then it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> that was I definitely some of the inspo. Definitely some of the inspo, the Western vibe, you know, them being on a ranch, you know, all that jazz. So glad yeah, you, it was like you Western really with like that. Hitchcock vibes and oh, Alfred Hitchcock vibes. And, oh, my God. It's the scary. way that Jordan puts his inspos together, it's absolutely insane. Like he puts the most odd but yet amazing things together that I just... He's just, that's why he's Jordan Peele. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Annie. I could talk to you all day. You're so much fun and you're just awesome. So, you know, come down to the show whenever that you, you want, girl. We enjoyed you. Thank you. Yes, I will. <laughs> okay. Well, you guys know what time it is. Okay, it's time to close out the show. And this time we are ending it with what's in my DMs. This week, I'm sharing the best real life how we met stories that sound like something straight out of a rom-com, okay? And as always, if you want to send me something, email me at babythisiskikipalmer at amazon.com because you know I love hearing from you. Okay, let's get into these real-life rom-com meet-cute stories. Number one, <clears throat> my dog fell in love with his dog, okay? Every time we would walk by him and his dog in my apartment, my dog would refuse to keep walking until she got to say hi to his dog. The dogs would play and have so much fun together. So eventually we decided to exchange numbers so the dogs could have a doggy play date. That doggy play date turned into the best first date I ever had. We instantly hit it off, just like our dogs. And we've been doing it doggy styles for three years since. I'm kidding, I made that part of <laughs> And we have been together <laughs> for three years since. 
It truly felt like it was a direct copy of 101 Dalmatians. That's so cute. The good old dog gag. We love a good dog love story. Our dogs brought us together. Okay, I'm here for that. Okay, number two. I was a teacher assistant in college and was in their office when the most beautiful woman in the world walked in to talk to the teacher. I was seriously blown away. After she left, I asked my teacher who that was, and they told me her name. I figured out what class she was in and enrolled in the class and introduced myself to her. Looking back, that might have been extreme, but I knew she was the one. I met her in class and I asked her to go out with me. And by some miracle, she said yes. We went on a date and started dating right after. That was 47 years ago. And we have been happily... No. Okay, guys, so now I have to pause really quickly then and tell you my parents love story very quickly love because those people were trying to hit on my parents love story y'all so i have to tell y'all my parents were literally like a rom-com y'all it's too good so I'm, I'm trying to make this quick so my mom was actually like the the characters that we don't like in movies they're like i don't need a man i got a career i got the life ahead of me she was actually given that <laughs> and she was focused on becoming an actress. You know, she was in speech tournaments and doing all that kind of stuff. She was in, in, in speech and debate. And she ended up going on this speech, uh, you know, trip to win, you know, these awards or whatever. You know, they have the big old conventions and stuff like that. So my mom goes and my dad ends up seeing her while she's performing during one of the tournaments. And my mom, you guys, she's an incredible singer. I, you know, she really is a beautiful singer because her voice, you can just feel her heart and her soul and her voice and it all is so effortless, but it's just so genuine when she, when she sings. And so my dad, he heard her singing. He said, when I saw that your mama was singing, I immediately thought to myself, this is the most beautiful woman that I ever seen. And her voice literally just pierced into my soul. And I just knew I had to have her. And so I try to talk to her after the uh, convention because she won. You know, he's like, your mom won. And I'm like, of course she did. She a Virgo. <laughs> so he's like, your mother won. And, you know, from there, he tries to talk to her at the after party. But my mom was unfortunately being very bourgeois because she was like, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh. she said he basically, he said she basically shrugged him off. Like, you know, she was just not interested in speaking to him. And so he kind of was like, okay, well, I'm not going to keep on trying to, you know, don't want to be too much to the lady. So I'll, I'll let it go for now. So he goes, you know what I mean? He ends up getting another little honey. Mind you, this trip is in New Orleans. So they're in good old New Orleans, having them a good old vibe. So he goes back from, you know, getting turned down from my mom. And my dad is very handsome. Let's get into it. I get my looks for him. He's very cute. So he found him another little lady to get it on with. Funny thing about it is the roommate that my dad had happened to be one of my mom's friends. So she's coming back one day with her to, to see her friend that's near my dad and walks in on him in the bed with this woman. <laughs> Honey, she walks in and pretty much sees him quickly butt naked. He quickly covers himself up. You know what I mean? And it's like so embarrassing because obviously this is the man that was trying to get with me. And then now he's here with this lady. And I, you know what I mean? So it definitely ruffled like a little feather. But it's like, how could she be mad? Because that wasn't her man and she didn't even want to talk to him. So make a long story short, the mutual friend that they had, they all live in Illinois. And when they go back to Illinois, they're talking and talking. And my dad keeps saying, get that woman my number, that woman that was there, Sharon. Get her my number. Get her my number. You know what I mean? Like, let me let me talk to Sharon. Let me just get an opportunity with Sharon. And so finally, they exchange numbers. And my mom is, like, talking back and forth with him. And they're talking. And he keeps saying, let's go on a date. Let's go on a date. And she's like, you know, I don't really do all that. You know, I'm a suburb girl. You know, because my mom is from the suburbs and my dad is from the city. My dad grew up in Cabrini Green and my mom grew up in Robbins. And so... My mom is like, no, you know, I'm good. You know, if you want to come see me, you got to come out to the city. You got to come out of the city because I don't really do all that. And she was being very bourgeois still. <laughs> and it got to the point, <laughs> it got to the point where my dad was like, you know what? I've had enough, you know, and he called her up one day. He said, now, look, I'm not trying to bother you. So all you got to do is let me know is if you ain't really interested in me. I don't know if you playing cool or you being whatever, but if you're really not interested in me, let me know because I'm not looking for no more friends and I'm not looking to play no games with nobody. I really want to take you out. And if you're interested, then give me a chance. And if not, I will leave you alone for good. 
And my mama was shook, honey. She was like, okay, like, all right, well, then let's go ahead and go out. So they go out on a date, right? <laughs> so they go out, they go out on a date, right? The date is great. You know, they go out on a date. The date is great. They keep going out on dates. They're having a good time, but my mom still got her guard up because what y'all don't know is that she had an opportunity in New York. She had gotten accepted to a lot of uh, schools, one being Juilliard. And so she was like, I'm going to New York, honey, to be a, a, a singer and a writer and an um, actor. I've got big dreams, so I really can't be falling in love with no man over here in Chicago. I got to go on and do my dreams. I got to pursue my career. You know what I mean? And she was very serious about it. And so my dad is like, you know, no problem. That ain't no problem. You know, I just want to, you know, I, I really care, you know, to get to know you. And I just think you're a nice lady. So, you know, it's, I, I support whatever that you're trying to do. And so my mom goes to, to, to New York. She, you know, gets ready to take her flight to New York. She's on her way. And this is the, like, real rom-com part of their storyline. It's because my dad, he was so sweet because before that she left to go he wanted to go and get her you know get her flowers and everything and be sweet to her for her flight and my mom wouldn't let him know what time she was leaving what gate she was at or anything like that so he came all the way to the airport and thought that he had missed her but really she just didn't want anything to do with it because she didn't want to get emotionally tied up. So my dad came to the airport, you know, try to be romantic and my mom pretty much just kind of turned it down. So make a long story short, that was kind of how they ended. But he, she had a number that she gave him. She was staying with her auntie, her cousin, them. And she, you know, he kept calling her. He just kept calling. My dad kept calling her. He even started to write her letters. He would write her letters and write her poems and just, just a sweet man to her, right? Um, and then it was one big thing that happens, two big things that, that changed everything. The first was my mom needed tap shoes. As you guys know, it don't matter if you get accepted into a great school or not, you still got to pay shit. <laughs> you know, if, if it, once you get into the school, you got to pay for the school. Then you got to pay for the stuff they want you to get. I mean, it's just like, that's, that's the issue with it. It's like, am I, do y'all want me at the college or not? Hell. And so my mom got accepted to, the, to a great school and she was going and performing, but she had to still pay for all these things that she just simply couldn't afford. You know, her father passed when she was a kid and all her siblings, she was the baby of the family and they had their own life. Some of them had kids and she had, just her mom, who was a hairstylist and would help whenever that she could, but she had sold her shop. So my mom was kind of just like out on her own trying to make things happen for herself. And so she was calling my dad one day. She was sad and she said, you know, I just don't have any money for any tap shoes. And, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Um, the next day, my dad sent her the money for her tap shoes. <laughs> you guys, so that was huge. That was huge. Because my mama had had nobody really, you know, but her mama do anything nice like that for her. So my dad had bought her the tap shoes, y'all. And then my mom was still trying to keep chill. She was still trying to be chilled on my dad. She still wasn't trying to do too much. So all of a sudden, a couple of, you know, after they keep on talking and she's opening up a bit to him, she's getting closer. She's letting her wall down because my mom was very guarded. And next thing you know, she don't hear from my dad. She hear from him all the time. And then all of a sudden, she don't hear from my dad. And she's like, what the hell is going on? Like, you know, this is crazy. And so finally, she gets a call. And my mom is like, what the hell is going on? You know, um, because Larry always called me and like, this is ridiculous. And I don't have time for any games. And Larry got into an accident. He got hit by a truck. My dad had gotten hit by a truck, y'all. He had literally gotten hit by a truck so bad that his mouth had to get sewed shut. And so he could not call my mom and tell her, you know, hey, I, 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 and, and I'm not, it's not that I'm not trying to call you. It's just that I, you know, got into, a car, got into an accident. When I tell y'all that my mom was on the first flight out, she said, it was in that moment that I knew I could never not have this man in my life and I could never not be by his side. And she left New York and she went and married my dad and they've been together ever since. Now tell me that story ain't everything, guys. That's my and parents' God, love story. And, and then God blessed us with beautiful children and <laughs> you are doing everything that I could have ever imagined to do. 
<laughs> I love that story, mom. I love that story so much. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for my parents. And, and when we're li listening to these stories, I'm like, I cannot not tell you guys the best rom-com that I know that's true. So that's my that's my that's my my the the the, the Palmer story. And it's just so cool too cuz in numerology, my mom is a 1, my dad is a 3, and I'm a 2. And one when there, whenever there's 1, 2 and 3, there's magic. Um and I definitely feel like ma magic about our our life and in our uh bond in our family. So that's uh you know another one. I mean I, I I can end with this with this last one that a reader sent, but I had to like you know go off on the limb and tell you guys that one. This last story didn't come from my DMs, but it instead came from my producer Emily. What's up, Emily, my girl? So here it is. In 2014, I was in Vegas for a Labor Day weekend with my friends from college. We were out by the pool when I realized all my friends had gone back to the room without telling me. Okay, I started walking away to try and find where my friends went when I heard a stranger sneeze. I told the stranger, bless you, and he responded with thanks. Do you want to come hang out with me and my friends? I realized saying yes could have been a bad situation, but thank God I did. Because when I went to meet his friends, I immediately was drawn to one of the guys who I thought looked just like Andrew Garfield. I told him that and then spent the rest of the day with him. Andrew Garfield is adorable. Anyway, we exchanged numbers and kept in contact and eventually started officially dating in December. We've been together for eight years and are getting married later this year. <laughs> that is so sweet. And that's the thing, right? Because now we're in this damn era where we don't know who we could trust and everything is so spooky and scary and uh, but sometimes taking those chances out and coming out there and just saying hey to somebody can end up having you find your damn man. It's giving Big Mama's house, go on and get your man. Sometimes it's like hard to figure out, but I feel like it's good when you take a chance, you know what I mean? If you can't have the opportunity to take a chance, um, you know, cause then maybe you, you'll, you'll have a spontaneous adventure. I think that's just so cute. So cute. And I love that for him. Huh. All right, guys. I mean, we went down the tunnel of love and through the river of opinions and conversations. And here we are at the end. Anybody else want to pop some popcorn and settle in for a rom-com marathon? Because <laughs> I'm about to launch into a 24-hour marathon, baby. Okay? Let's get into it. As always, until next time, you know it's your girl.
day has come. The day you had a meeting without sneezing all over. Where you went to...